Great. In this breakout session, come on up. Uh, I, you'll see better. You'll hear better. Uh, if you are not going to participate in the session, uh, I, you know, if you want to just do your email quietly, you're welcome to stay. But if you're going to have a conversation, please uh, take it outside. Wow. That's twice you've been there. <laughs> yeah, well. Yeah, that's right. Anybody else uh, want to move up? You bring your own pot again. It's really cool. <laughs> All right. No, it's okay. If I get to, so, well, we may want one. Just a, a little bit of uh, preamble but it's okay. uh, about the topic I've here. I've been an academic. Um, as some of you know, uh, uh, you've seen in our business value map that one of the, uh, in fact, the highest rated uh, uh, thing on the business value map was attract and retain authors. Uh, two-thirds of our publishers had that in their top three. Uh, so last uh, summer and fall, uh, I started working uh, to try and figure out what products and services could Highwire introduce that would help attract and retain authors. I did interviews with, with uh, uh, 10 to 12 publishers about how do you do this now and so on. Uh, but among the interviews that I did uh, was an interview with Anurag. Uh, to ask him for his ideas. And uh, he, he basically said, you know, use Google Scholar metrics. And I thought about it, and I said, well, I don't have to build that. That's no fun. Uh, but he has something that uh, he, I wanted him to describe to you, since this is something that all of you can do now, uh, is, is use Google Scholar metrics. I thought, why not just describe it directly uh, to the publishers uh, so you can think about the, the concept of how this will help you attract and retain authors. This isn't like another impact factor. This is really something quite different. So that's the, the uh, what, the first half or third of the uh, session? Maybe, maybe I don't know. It depends uh, on whether I get questions in the middle. And, uh, and uh, then uh, when we're uh, done talking about Google Scholar metrics, we'll just switch to whatever questions you have uh, for, uh, for Google Scholar, for Onrog. Uh, you're welcome uh, to ask. So that's the ask me anything part. So it's really a two-part session. Anurag? Thank you, John. It's a pleasure to be here again. Um, I've had the pleasure of being here many times. It's been a lovely coming back. Uh, so this time I would be talking about some following up on the conversation with John, uh, talking about what we, a metric system that we built initially to get an idea, not as a metric system. Our initial goal was to get an idea of how likely this a publication in this journal is going to be of interest to somebody. We do recommendations. We also do ranking for recent articles. And for re something that's recently published, history, is the best measure you can use as a predictor, which is a question I asked Greg, you know, you, the author that published, or the place that it was published. The two most important measures of the likelihood of something being of interest. Success is a very complicated thing in terms of being able to predict. Once we build that, then we basically said, how can we make this externally visible? What would be interesting to make externally visible? And as you build a metric, what would you want to pick as a success measure that will help you decide the question that we started with? What would make this paper interesting? What is the likelihood that this paper will be interesting? So that's what I will talk about it. Take a little bit of time to take a step back and see what metrics have been uh, in the environment of the past and what metrics in today's environments probably need to be. Of course, that's a little bit biased because that's how we designed ours, but <laughs> that at least gives an idea of, <laughs> at least gives an idea of how to think about metrics in the world that has fundamentally changed in the last 20 to 25 years. So let's take a step back 
Go back to the days when everything was on the shelf. You had to, as a, if you were a librarian, there were two things you were optimizing within. You had a budget of money. And then you had a budget, a real budget of shelf space. And you had to pick your, you had to do your acquisitions keeping both of them in mind. So the metrics that were designed took the physical space requirement into account. It had to worry about every single article because every article, no matter how good, bad, or interesting it was, took inches on the shelf space. So what you effectively ended up with was first, caring about every article. Second, effectively counting impact per inch, value per inch. And that's why we ended up with all the averaging measures that are out there. You have to average across everything. Looking at it from the author's point of view, what such an analysis did was that most libraries subscribe to a core set that most, most everybody did, then, then a penumbra of things that was of interest to their specific faculty. And that, in some sense, drives itself in a feedback loop because as an author, that defines what your distribution, your audience size is. So you're going to pick the journals that everybody subscribes to. They're going to be the best because that's where everybody submits to. Switch 25 years and forward. Journals are online. Pretty much all journals are online. Distribution is equal for all journals. Audience is not the same issue. Shelf space is not the same issue. Every article doesn't matter as much. The successes matter. Those are the ones that are going to drive the field. Those are the ones that are going to change what the researchers that come down in the next generation are going to base their research on. That is the article that I, as a researcher, want to write. That's the one that I want to be a part of. As a researcher, as from, from a user point of view, I no longer have to browse things. From, from a conceptual point of view, the, there's also not a cost of having a large number of articles. Articles that I don't care about don't show up for me. Only things that shows up for me is what is relevant to my work. You can focus on what matters to you or what is successful. You can chase, pick whichever measure of these that you would like. For libraries, the success is of subscriptions being used. You know, since you don't have to worry about shelf space, you have to worry about what is being used. And the usage graph, like everything else, is extremely skewed. Some papers get read a lot. A lot of papers get read occasionally. Successes matter. The long tail matters some. If you look at, from an author's point of view, the success measure has always been the same, reputation. But since distribution is no longer the issue, what is the issue? Issue is part of being a success, which is always the case. Can I, now when I'm going to look for which journal to publish in, I would like to pick the place where I'm likely to be successful. This is the community I'm joining. I come to Stanford as a faculty member, God, if I had a choice, because everybody recognizes that being at Stanford is, is a success. Similarly, if you are in a community that is known to be successful, that is the community I want to be a part of, just like everybody wants to be a part of AAAS, everybody wants to be a part of National Academy of Sciences, whatever, that's the basic notion. It's the club of successful people, recognized as successful people by my community. Success matters to authors. 
being seen as being successful. So the idea overall is to focus on the successful papers, put away the notion of having to account for every single article out there. Focus on the high end. A metric that tries to do this is the H index. Originally proposed for individuals, but the idea is if you look at, I can't point out, if you look at this region, that is what you are counting. Can I? Okay. That's the only time I would need to use it, so it's okay. What the H index measures is the upper end of your distribution. The citation distribution always is an extremely skewed distribution that goes from a high peak, slopes down very rapidly. You focus on the left high end of it. So what did we do? That's all background. What did we actually do? We picked a five-year time period to compute H index over four journals. Five years to cover disciplines with slower moving research cycles. In general, STM tends to be faster. Uh, theoretical tends to be faster still. If you're in high energy physics, before the year is over, most of your citation cycle may be over. But if you're in, say, for sociology, it's probably two, three years down when you're beginning to ramp up. So you pick a number that sits in between and is not overly long. There are two measures. There's H5 index, which is the H index for five years, and H5 median, which is tries to tries to take what is the median citation for everybody that make up the H index. So the question is, why do you have two measures? Um, this, in some sense, is a different way of trying to do uh, 3.59536 as your measure. Ultimately, once you go look at any measures, measures will end up being the same for many publications. There are going to be many journals with H index of 29. So then the question is, is there any difference that might be useful from the point of view of an author, of a library, of a publisher? So what would be such difference? The difference is, when we look at the H index, we are doing counting. We are saying 29 papers had more than 29 citations. But those 29 for one publication may be thousands. They may be skewed at the upper end. For other of them, they may be hovering around 29. What H5 median does is to differentiate between those cases, saying if, the, if you're spread out, your median is going to be somewhere in the middle. If you're just entirely sitting around uh, the H index, then your H5 median is going to be the same as H. There are categorized lists for English publications for you can browse by, I'll, go, I'll show you. You can browse by eight broad categories and about 250 specific categories. Journals can appear in multiple categories, necessary, because many journals are inherently interdisciplinary, and the categories themselves are blurry anyways at boundaries. Uh, you can, for each journal, you can actually see the witness list. Here is a list of articles that make up, and now that's where it begins to get back to interesting in terms of authors. You can see the club that you will be joining. Here are the articles, here are the authors. Here are the successes. So let's go take a look. Is it okay, can I just click and go bring up, or do I have to do anything fancy how this is displayed? Can I just bring up a browser? As simple as that? Okay, that's good, that, um, I thought that might be a little bit complicated. Just a browser. That's good. That's good. Okay, now I'll have to figure out how to actually manipulate this thing. How do I actually point to it? You have to 
no, 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 but I have to actually click on something and type stuff. Yeah, you can, you can <laughs> just kind of watch here. And use the oh, that's good. Yeah. I can do that. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Actually, that should have occurred to me. Thank you. It is silly of me not to have thought about this. And a bigger, so the secret to metrics, and you enter there, you get publications ordered in H, H5 index across everything. You can first of all say, okay, prove it to me. Show me who the, what the club is. And you get all of them. You can browse through it. You can go read the article. Or you can say, who's citing them? What is the group at the second order? You can browse through. Categories. So you can pick a broad category, health and medical sciences. And these are uh, the publications in my health and medical sciences. You can pick then a subcategory. Say dermatology. Then you get down to dermatology. You can zip in. You can look around. For every given journal, for every given category, you can see what the successful papers as uh, seen by citation metrics are and who the authors are. You can see what your peer group is. Ultimately, that is the success measure for any author, to be seen as being successful being publishing where, it, where the things were successful. When I was a graduate student, I was told, publish in this conference, because that is the conference that all the successful people publish in. That's, what, that's the idea that is basically behind over here. Can I now go back to? So currently we are, in, are more inclusive, largely because Google Scholar has been more inclusive in terms of indexing. So any journal that has at least 100 articles over five years and has at least one citation to any of the articles in the, in the journal is included. You pick 100 because you need to have some measure to say that this is a serial and not a one-time publication. Whether 100 is the right number, I don't know. It seemed like a good right round number that seemed to include practically everything that we were trying to include. It includes uh, journals in every language, a fairly large number. You have two ways of interacting with it. One is the browse that I just showed you. In a category, you can see 20 journals, the top 20 journals by IBA, by H5 index. Whatever is not in the browse can be searched for using keywords, just normal keywords as you would always otherwise do. H5 index, as I described, focuses on the successful papers. It highlights the best. It shows, it tells you right there, lists them for you, and lists who the authors are. For you as an editor, for you as a publisher, and most of all, for you as an author. The second interesting characteristic for people who are interested in metrics is that counting metrics like H5, H index are noise resistant. A single paper does not skew the metric. Uh, occasional error in assigning categories, saying this is a research paper versus this is a non-research paper, does not skew the metric. <clears throat> Averaging in terms of you worry about whether this, this group of paper should be included in the 
uh, counting as in the, of the, on the averaging of this group should not be included is not an issue. You are focusing entirely on the successes. If an editorial is an impactful editorial, so be it. You not have to worry about these differences. The other advantage is that if you publish 100 papers in your first year, it gets picked up in the first year, which is not an unusual thing. Uh, 10 articles per issue, 10 issues in a year, or 12 issues in a year, easy to hit 100. You don't have to wait for a period of time to basically begin to get an idea of uh, how it is being received. Of course, it takes the normal research cycle to figure out how it is being received. You get the full idea of how the reception is, but you begin to get an early idea, or at least. A concern which H index always has been uh, since we launched to larger venues do better. Since, the den since you're not averaging, well, the denominator is a non-issue. Do you again then get a bigger pool to choose from and therefore have more successes? The issue with H index is that, as not an issue, a feature of H index is that as you climb the numbers, to go from 31 to 32, now 32 different papers need to get one more citation. And to go from 32 to 33 is 33 more papers need to go get one more citations. To climb these things, you have to have a larger number of better papers. Just joining two journals, for example, doesn't achieve that. There is, of course, a notion that if you have a large number of papers that are successful, that have impacted the direction of their own fields, then, then it is entirely reasonable for it to be recognized. Because you, if you have changed the direction of your field by picking 500 good papers and another 500 that were not good papers, you have impacted the, change, the, the direction of your field. What more can you ask for, for in terms of impact? This allows you to even be a little bit more risky in de deciding which papers to accept, where you can sort of hit for the fences, rather than trying to worry about whether this is going to lower my number or whether it's not going to lower my number. In terms of, so how can actually use this? The simplest way is to let authors quickly see what is the club that they would be joining. We are currently doing that with several platforms. We do, I mentioned the CLO, this is a platform in Latin America. They're doing it across all of their instances. Uh, Cyberlalinka is uh, a large collection in Russia. And Springer is planning this initially for conferences, because conferences have no metrics at all um, anywhere else, and then looking at broadening it out. So we can make the statistics as well as links and everything else available if there is interest. That's what we are doing with all the other platforms. To summarize, what we have built is a mechanism to highlight successes of journals. Every journal, every reasonable, useful journal has some successes. Let's focus on them, use them to draw other authors in to, to build a journal, especially if it's a newer journal. I think I've said all of these things before, so rather than repeat them again, I'll leave you to read them <laughs> and open it up to questions. Yeah. Uh, so let's start with questions about uh, scholar metrics. Um, uh, so you're, what you're proposing is that uh, in, in order to attract authors, uh, journals essentially show them the club they would be joining yes. by submitting. Yes. Uh, so on your submission page, you know, submit a manuscript page, or maybe on your, your journal home page, uh, you would put the link to your journal's scholar metrics. You can put it on your journal page. You can actually put it on your article metrics page. That's true. Yep. Because in some sense, or on your article page, I mean, the actually CLO and uh, Cyberlalinka put it on every article. Their point is, that's where most of my authors interact, that potential authors interact with my journal. So that's what they do. 
That's not the only option, but that's the... So there is a fixed uh, URL. Yes. Uh, so we need to get microphones to... Uh, oh, you have it. Good. So there's a fixed URL that anybody can, can go to that, that is persistent for their yes. journal. Yes. Okay. All right. Crispin? So I could easily be sold on this because I'm looking at the listing for botany and our two journals are 10 and 11 <laughs> points ahead of the, the next journal and at the top of the ranking there. You know, wherever we put the link to this list and, and the links to each of the journals, I need a little icon next to that link that says in a little pop-up of a sentence or to what an H5 index is so that yeah. the, the, the author yeah. can make or the presumptive author can yeah. make an informed decision about whether she or he cares a hoot about that metric. Yeah, of course. So what is that? What is an H5 index? Yeah, in that many words. Uh, you're saying... Uh, I'm asking you to tell me what it is <laughs> in that many words. Uh, what an H5 index is? Yeah. Yes, I can. Um, so H5 index is the H index over five years. The H index is defined as uh, the largest number, uh, largest number H, so that at least H papers have H citations. Um, let me go back and show you a different way of presenting that. In some sense, okay. this is the point. So uh, can I can I just so th that's the the reason for picking this sort of seemingly cute this thing is to avoid having a fixed boundary, and the fixed boundary doesn't work when you go across different fields and you'll have to pick up arbitrary boundaries in every field, and this is an approach of trying to work around that. Yes, sir. So um, y you you said that the thing that it will appeal to most is the people it will appeal most to is authors. Right. Um, yet for most papers in most journals, the people who write those papers are very far from the H index of the journal because most papers are cited little in any journal. It always has the same distribution. And one of the things that I've I, you do notice when you look at the very, <coughs> big, the very successful journals is that there is a change that happens as you're looking at it and, and the high side of the citation as mm -hmm. it goes down like that. Mm -hmm. If you're plus one, you're like that. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're nature, you're kind of like that. So I wondered whether you... That's, that's the H5 median doing for you. So the yeah. question is, if I look at the... What it tries to do is to get some of the distribution mm -hmm. back into the picture. No, I understand yeah, that, sorry. but I just wondered whether you'd thought of also looking at... The, the, the H index is, uh, as you're looking at, is based on a notion at that end of the distribution because it's based on H papers of, with H citations. Have you, have you got, a, I guess the, quip, the question is, do you have a quip, an equivalent of the H medium, median looking at the other end of the spectrum so that you can then say to an author, you know, I can, pre I can predict the minimum times that your paper's going to be cited compared with another journal because most papers are going to be most 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 papers from most journals have few citations, and that would be really that would be a real incentive to me if I was an author. It's like I want to sub submit to Nature, not because I'm going to get cited 50 times because hardly any papers are, but I'm going to be pretty sure I'm going to be cited at least eight. Uh, so the time time to be cited at least eight times, is that the suggested metric? No, I just wondered if you were if you if you were, if you had a metric at the other end of the distribution. He's saying how many papers have no citations? I mean, what, a lot of them have very few citations. I'm not sure what metric would I compute on that end. Well, you, you were saying the H5 median. Was no, it, something else. In no, because the H5 median is higher than the H index, right? Yes. Yeah, that's true. Yes, it is. So, so, so this I'm is saying, the concept. Is there a number that you uh, can have the other side of the H5 index that gives um, a, a, a sense of the, the extent to the which the distribution is skewed? So what, what would I use that measure for? So from my, I'll, t I'll give you what, why I come at it. I use this to decide which journals as papers that are brand new are likely to be of interest to people. I look for successes. No, if I'm an author, but you said- I, you I said understand you're, you're an author, yeah. but if I give you that complicated metric, what are you going to get out of it? You, 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 either you tell me that uh, time to first citation, simple to understand metric, you can compute that, and maybe that would be useful. Yeah. Or you can say time to five citations or 20 citations or whatever. You can pick those numbers. 
You can give fraction, you can do a histogram if you like, saying how many papers are going to get 10 citations. But I'm telling you, that's not why people decide to say, if, if somebody says half the papers in this journal got no citations and other half were superstars, you would get people rushing to that. No one's going to say, you know, this is, I mean, everybody is above average, right? Yeah. Right, okay. No, I mean, that, you've, so you've, you've explained the logic perfectly. So I understand why you haven't done what I asked. So, so the, it's this it's is an aspirational a... thing. It's what I want to be. It's not what, the, what reality in, in some ways is. I mean, reality for all of us is that we will kind of have medium sort of lives. But we aspire to the, 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 the magic. Kind of a doubter so far. So... <laughs> So what, what uh, Richard's uh, talking about is something that uh, w uh, in doing impact visor we call background radiation, that a paper in science tends to get cited more than a paper in PNAS, which tends to get cited more than a paper in the Journal of Antiquity Even Research. The Even the bad ones. There's this background radiation, uh, and it just, you know, it, and, and there probably is a way to measure it, but I think what Anurag's saying is people are aspirational, uh, in when they're, when they're looking at a club. They want to marry up, uh, you know, if you will. Yes, yes. Uh, Susan? Hi, Anurag. Um, what's the difference then between the H-index that's calculated in Google Scholar and the H-indexes that are calculated in Web of Science and Scopus? Is it the five-year window? Um, well, there are two issues, right? Uh, I don't know. Do they compute H-indexes for journals? Yeah, I think so. I'm just looking okay. at a, an Australian I'm pretty um, sure Scopus page does. here okay. that says Web of Science. So H index appears on the right-hand side of the screen. Um, from Scopus, from the search tab, H index appears on the right-hand side of the screen. Okay. So they do seem to be calculating them. So there's going to be two differences. Uh, what, is included, what is included in the index? So that's one difference in terms of you looking at the specific numbers. The process is the same. The idea is the same. There's no difference in that regard. The, you know, you're computing H index. Uh, you're not computing a new math, but five year time period is one we pick. Somebody else can also pick five years and they would be just as valid. Yeah, I can't tell here if, if, they're, if, they're, if it's a true H index and it's going back to the length of time of the journal or if it's that five year that you're talking about. And then the other thing is, I get it that size doesn't matter for the, um, uh, the H5 index, but doesn't size impact the median? Uh, no, size actually doesn't impact the median. My, my impacts the median even less. Okay. Because now you're talking about the actual citation distribution. Um, uh, well, I can't draw on this, but suppose <laughs> I could. It, was, it would be sort of like this for most of them. Mm -hmm. And the median is basically taking this point. Yeah. And that point size is not going to increase. Basically, the, the half of the most successful papers how successful are those? You have to lift this whole thing up to be able to get there. Pushing this thing up at the upper end is hard. One paper, you can get success. Two papers, yes. Getting 40 of them, 80 of them. Each of them. Or as <laughs> science does, 300 and something of them. Now that's different. So if you'd like to give this a try, uh, I'd like to do some kinds of experiments to see you know, how it works uh, for authors of journals in this room. So if you're interested in trying this, seeing if it does it in fact attract uh, authors, I, I'd really like to. Hey, Sean, can you get a mic down to, to Wayne? Um, I'd, I'd like to, to follow an experiment to see if we can see if it's is successful, because that's, that's what will convince all of you to do this, or none of you to oh, do nobody. it. John, uh, Wayne? Thinking of it as an author, if I wanted to give them a simple statement as to the value of this when I'm blinking from my icon, how would I say it? What's the best way to appeal to their aspirations and use this, um, assuming he, it's a good record? Of course. Here are the successful people, successful people and papers in this journal. This is the club that you will be joining if you publish here. Now, it's not true. It's not true. Publish with us to join the, the club. Yeah. Well, it, but I think it also helps you look at what are the successful papers. Are, there, are they papers that your, you and your colleagues are reading? Are you addressing my audience? Uh, I think that's part of it as well. 
it's not just the number. It's, it's saying, this, these are my colleagues. Yes, well, that, that, that's one thing. That's a very good point. It's not just the number that I am suggesting this. The number is nice. It's that's all a really out. good point. It's not just post your H5 number yes. on, on your, your page. It's show the list. It's the, see, being able to see that list, I think, that has the more power. The number, there are numbers here, there are numbers there. Some, it's not clear what they mean to you. So your notion of a diving in the rough before that list might surprise people as to how high a particular journal is on that list. Yes, that's a lovely thing. There you go. All right, uh, why don't we switch to the uh, AMA uh, part of this session. Just looking at what time. Yep, thanks. So, uh, yeah, you know, we could go a little bit past that if people want to stay here. We go on a break after this. So, uh, questions in general uh, for Anurag. Uh, I just note that there are some questions he's not allowed to answer and some he probably can't answer. Those might be different, uh, but please ask. But what I can, I will. And most things about Scholar, apart from well, how big it is, I should be able to. <laughs> The, Who's going to ask that one? <laughs> this is a specific uh, use problem that we've run into at um, I'm Tara Kelly. I'm from um, Science AAAS. Um, we've had authors um, get very upset because their uh, paper is in bio, their bio archive paper is listed in Google Scholar, yet the science paper that was published later is not. Um, what, what is the correct way to go about getting that He'll get straightened fixed. out? He'll, He'll get, get straightened out eventually? They don't like that answer. Sure. It'll get fixed very quickly. <laughs> Usually it gets fixed within a few months. Okay, and if they... That's not correct. Yeah, if, 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 if they press... So let me... let me do? Okay, let me, let me describe this a bit more better okay. than, than that, that very quick answer. So Scholar is designed to fit the sort of bimodal nature of scholarly publishing. There's a lot of stuff that's archival. That's not supposed to change. That's not that it never changes, but it's not supposed to change. And then there is the new stuff that's expected to change, go through versioning, get modified. What we do is we rescan new papers continuously, repeatedly, to pick up any versioning update that happens. So most of the versioning update that happens ahead of print, accepted manuscript, Oh, practically at this point, all papers go through this versioning and you don't notice in Scholar. Mostly because this mechanism of turning this thing around does what it is supposed to do. Mm -hmm. You do, and it groups all the versions together. So if there's a preprint and there's a final version, the final version, if you can figure that final version out in some time period after the first version, first version becomes available, then you get replaced immediately. Those updates happen three times a week. So if, now there are many articles which never transition from an early version to a later version. So after some point of time, they are basically marked as they are, these are potentially archival. The potentially archival things get updated periodically. And that's, that is a situation in which something that has been in that state long enough and happen to not, it's even more complicated than, and happen to, not, happen to be published across a particular update cycle. Mm -hmm. they, these are the ones that basically get picked up as uh, being still in the archival stage when they have had a version update. Next time we update it, it gets updated. So you're saying that if a paper goes fairly quickly from archive stage maybe in a few months to being in final publication. It just happened. Okay. Yeah, even even it, longer. It's a, as I said, you have to have basically be in a situation where the determination of potential archive happens on one end, one side of the indexing cycle, and the other step happens on the other end of the cycle. Then you basically have a split, saying I decided this is a potential archival, but it changed version later. So you have to straddle this boundary, and, yeah, and you have to be long enough. Just keep in mind, at this point, millions of papers per year go through this versioning. That is the universe in which we are running this versioning, all of these things together. Today, no other system actually manages versioning of all of these papers at the same time. 
And so there are occasional boundary cases, and there are there. And for the author, it is annoying, especially if it is in science. No end. <laughs> they, they sometimes care more about it than PubMed, actually. Sad. Hmm. Yeah. They, the younger, I, I've heard uh, complaints from younger researchers. Okay. Um, for, a, for, for an author, any one paper is sufficient as an indication of a world-shattering problem. I'll give you an example. I mean, you know this better than I do, but till we had author profiles, my email box was maybe five a week. When we added author profiles, it went two orders of magnitude. So I can understand. You know exactly what the right answer should be, and the right answer is not the right answer, and it matters to you, you would be upset. We are looking at ways of reducing that mechanism of sustaining, but there is an uh, edge there. And that edge, you can reduce it, but it doesn't entirely go away without basically re-indexing everything all the time. Then I have to crawl everything practically uh, every week. Yes. Yes. So from a practical standpoint, we probably don't really care how quickly you index things. The, from a practical standpoint, if we have somebody who's got a uh, question that says, look, my article needs to be recrawled for whatever reason, it doesn't yeah. matter what it is. Um, I know there are ways in uh, Webmaster Tools we can say, please drop this article, please you know, submit this for re-indexing. Is there any utility where we can submit a similar request that would cause re-indexing in Scholar? I so know. we can fix it ourselves so we don't no. know. Yeah. No, I'll tell you why. Rather than just say no, I'll tell you why. So the issue with the re-indexing archival stuff is that when you re-index something, it can change its description. Versioning changes, the title can change, the author list can change, all of these things can change. When you do that, you have to then recompute the relationship between all the articles. You're computing global properties like citation counts, which author wrote which paper. These are all global properties. Those global properties have to be recomputed. Now, you cannot recompute them by updating one thing. Right. So your answer is it's not just re-indexing. Yes, it is not just re-indexing that document. So that's, that's why you end up dividing into two sets. The new set, you put in all the effort because that's the place where most of the transition, 99% of the transitions happen. And that's why you never see them. You never notice that they are transitioning happening all the time and the links go the right place. Other questions? Susan? I can tell. I can just tell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this, this is actually going back to the um, earlier presentation before the H index, if that's okay. Um, sure. Um, and so, I understand. Uh, on CASA? On, ca on CASA, okay. actually. On CASA. So, um, you have to be logged into Google? No, that was, I think, mm -hmm. a, a, that was mm -hmm. not, not well uh, put. Um, uh, there are a couple of different uh, ways that we can make the link. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them is if the device, the physical device the user is on is the same device, then they don't need to be logged into anything. Or if they use a particular device on uh, a campus and they're logged in to Scholar, to, to any Google property, and then they go home, different device, but they're also logged in, then we can make that link too. Either case, we can make work. Okay. The, the, the key, the, the way to think of it, um, uh, we, we probably should have put up a slide. Uh, I think I used it in last year's presentation. Um, the, the whole goal of this is, it just works. That's his tagline. <laughs> I wish I had come up with that. It just works. The user doesn't do anything. In fact, the user the can't slide. do anything. Can show, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, a browser, yeah. The, uh, but the, the, basically what the user sees when they're on campus and they do a scholar search, uh, we can probably do it here, you see a bunch of links off on the right that, that basically tell you what you're subscribed to, which versions of which articles. So if you click on one of those blue links, you know you're going to get the article. And that's the, the users expect that because that's just the common thing that happens in Scholar. The idea is wherever they go, they're going to get the same links. 
that experience won't change. Whereas right now, when they go home, same device or, or what, the links all disappear because my home is not IP, is not recognized as an IP address on Stanford's campus. So th that's the, the concept of uh, Scholar. It just works, and those, those blue links on the right, they show up when you go home. You don't have to do anything. No, this people need to get out of this. I have another question. Okay, uh, uh, he, he's probably going to. I do. I do want to show you a demo of what what it would be like, and then then it makes. Yeah. It, so go ahead and ask your other question. And, it works and, much okay. better. So my other question. Well, actually, there's two questions. Um, so um, is that are these um, exclusive to the Highwire platform, or are no. you working with other publishers? Well, uh, so other so the the plan is that uh, we are sort of pioneering this, this mm -hmm. protocol. You are pioneering this protocol. I mean, that is, you're going to tell us if, if you get it, it doesn't work, are you worried about this or that. We're going to factor all that experience in. Uh, but the idea is that, that other platforms can implement this. It has to be that way. Otherwise, there'd be too few blue links for it to really change user behavior. Okay. We like being first, but. Uh, and my other question is, why would I opt out? I have no idea. <laughs> so let me, let me just ex let, let me We have to offer it. So I can tell you why. It's, uh, it's based on subscriber links. And so we felt we need to give you an, an ability to, uh, to opt out. If for some reason you, you thought, oh, well, this is, this is just going to be like Sci-Hub, go ahead, opt out. It's OK. Let me, let me ex show you what it would, the experience would be like. So right now, um, these examples, of course, are PNAS and therefore biased because they are all publicly available. But let's take the example of these uh, links. They indicate that these articles are available to you where you are on this IP. And the idea is when you go home, the interface should look just like this. Whatever you had access to, whatever the screen looked at when you were on campus, the screen should look the same when you go home. You don't learn anything new. You don't do anything new. The things, thank you, just works. Um, <laughs> overall, the other question you talked about in terms of what do they need to be, you need something to tie them together, either the device or the <coughs> logger, whichever one. So if, if you are on this thing, which is also a use case, which ties in with the quick abstracts aspect of this. If you're on this thing, then you're carrying this thing around. Maybe you're carrying your laptop around. So those things, the mechanism that is based on the device works. You're on your desktop, you have a home machine, you're logged in. A lot of people are already logged in. They read their mail. So the, the, for most people, it should just work way beyond just the single device that you're on. Uh, question there, and then over to Crispin. Um, I think what I'm confused about with CASA is how this kind of works with like library authentication. And I don't know if I'm completely missing the boat here, but like, so let me, let me describe what actually happens. Because I'm not surprised you think that's going to make it because we haven't <laughs> Well, we haven't actually described anything. We just said what would happen rather than how it would happen. So right now, if you're working with us for subscriber links, which is links like this that indicate to the user that you have access, when a user dumps, comes in and does a query, we effectively do two queries. First query is the query that you think of as a query. There's a keyword there, a set of relevant results. This populates the sequence of results that show up. Second is a query which says, this IP has access to what, through what mechanisms. You take the two result sets, you intersect them. Wherever there's an intersection, you see the right-hand side links. That says, here's what you have access to, here's the current query, you do an intersection, here's what results from this current query that you have access to. Currently, after having that query, we forget everything. Next query comes in, we start from scratch. 
idea is that you did a query, we looked up that information, the information said you are associated with, you have access to Stanford's subscription to nature. Idea is to record that fact for a period of time. So when you come back, and you are, can be shown as being the same person either by using the same device or by logged in the same way, then you basically reactivate the set of subscriptions, whatever was available to you when you did the previous query. So Does that, does that help? So it's the IP, IP recognition. It's the IP recognition that is being now carried along with you. When, when you sort of move off campus. So like the, so this is intended to kind of work in like supplementary to like the library VPNs? Yeah. yeah. Okay. It, you yeah. you okay. would not, you normally on a VPN. campus you don't log in, you might log into the network, but you don't log into the library. When you go home you have to log into a proxy sometimes. This eliminates that. Okay. And, and if you saw uh, Kenneth's slides this sort of show, there are one, what was it, 10 steps to log into a, a, a typical campus proxy? Right. Because every time somebody has to do it, they have to look up how to do it. Yeah. Right. Uh, right. And, and where to do it and what URL to use. It's, it's re even I hate it. Thank you, John. Um, if you're already logged in, um, you'll just go through the natural access subscriber control. But if you're not, then you'll get access through the CASA protocol. Yeah. So it is complementary. Yeah. So it, there are, uh, Jim Longo this morning mentioned this thing called Access Anywhere, which is our umbrella. I mean, I'm sure everybody has a different umbrella name for trying to get people access wherever they are, if they, if they have subscribed access. The, the idea that, that publishers talked about uh, last year was they use Sci-Hub for a couple of reasons. Uh, and one of them is because the, the off-campus access is really hard. Uh, so let's make it easier. And there are several approaches to doing that. CASA is one of them. Uh, Sam Sigma is another one. You're going to hear after the break uh, from Ralph Youngen about RA21, which is another one. And, and the nice thing is, these don't compete. You know, they, 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 they collaborate uh, so that the user doesn't have to say, oh my god, I need to know three things now. If any one of them works, you're in. Ralph? Yeah, can I follow up here? Uh, oh, there it is. I'm curious, I guess the part that troubles me a little bit is where you are associating my Google ID with a subscriber list. You know, and, and you're doing that passively where I have not said that I want you to do that. And uh, you know, I can't get my head around this, whether this really runs afoul of any emerging privacy regulations or not, but there's, it troubles me that there's something going on there that is happening without user consent. And typically that does run afoul of privacy regulations, you know, if you're doing something without user, user assent, you know, to do that. So I don't really have a question. I don't really, you know, it's just a comment and it's a little bit of a, of, a, of a slight concern that I have there, but I didn't know if you had thought about that. Would you have the same concern about providing IP-based access to you at all? Well, I do have concerns about IP-based access. No, 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 do you, have, do, you, do you have privacy? <laughs> Do you, do you have the same sort of concern that you just expressed? Well, in some... Wait, it, let me, let me, let okay. me elaborate. That something is happening to you without your consent. Would you have the same concern that because you're coming in from a Stanford IP, you're being treated differently than you would be otherwise without me, being, without me saying, yes, I should be? I don't know how to answer that. No, so no, I'm saying the, the question is, no, we don't, because that's what, how we have learned to work, make this whole system work. We expect this thing to work. When the user expects things to work a particular way, then this concern doesn't arise. The problem arises when you do something unexpected. Mm -hmm. that, that's the reason why I was trying to get at that mm -hmm. notion. So I think what we, what we should do is, in, when we document this for librarians and so on, we should probably address, OK, what, what is, is there a privacy issue? How do we make this, this link? Uh, Chris, why don't we make this the last question because it, it, yeah, the break really has started for everybody the same, else. Same lines, but sort of from the opposite direction. So, so this works um, 
best when the usage on a campus is legitimate. And, and it sort of more or less requires that. But if I'm able to log into a network, and I, I don't know if, if as a guest here in this building, I now have access to any of the content licensed to Stanford. But, but at some other campus that doesn't have as good security c protocols as this one does, you know, once I've logged in there, I can carry my computer around and, and get all of their stuff wherever I am, um, illegitimately. So, so what's built in to protect against that? Your, your association expires. Pardon? Your association expires. Okay. Because if you can come back regularly, then effectively you have found a way to get access through that university one way or the other. If you're accidental, you happen to be on campus today, you're doing drive-by access one day. <laughs> drive-by. <laughs> on one day, it doesn't stay with you. It gives you some amount. Yeah. There are clever people who will figure out how to gain your system to stay at home. But keep, it, keep in mind, any mechanism that tries to manage access has to look for anomalous patterns. It doesn't matter how we do this. Whether we do it based on login, we do it based on IP, whatever we do, unless we manage, the one thing I want to point out, IP of all places, of all mechanisms that are available is the least spoofable at to date. The number of accounts that have been hacked over the last three years, you can look at 500 million from Yahoo, some, something from someplace else, that is common and it's going to become hugely common. To expect that library systems are going to manage the security of their account systems is an ambitious expectation. So a part of what we're building into, we, we think of it as a beta phase of, of some months, uh, is to look at these anomalous patterns. Uh, you know, somebody who is in Uzbekistan one day and Harvard the next. Uh, and hmm, hmm. Uh, and just watch for that and, and just document how much that happens. Because if, if, you know, it might be if it happens once a month, it's like, gee, that's better than now. Uh, but if it happens a thousand times a day, you say, okay, this isn't secure enough. All right. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Anurag. Thank you. Uh, we're, we're on a break. <laughs>